Chapter 6, Anatomy and Physiology. Remember, anatomy is a study of the structure of the body, and phys physiology is how it all works together. One of the best tools I found for anatomy is the Anatomy Coloring Book. This is the book we used in my paramedic school. It's probably the most uh, valuable tool I had of all the books they gave us. It sounds simple. It's 10 to $15, depends on what features you want to get and what versions you get buy that in a box of crayons and you will know your anatomy and physiology really good before by the time you're done so highly recommend you get something like this uh, plus it's uh, kind of de-stressing to color and try to stay in the lines so it's something good you can use to kind of help you understand anatomy and physiology better so locating the body parts we're looking uh, just kind of looking at the body, you can see where different parts are. And then uh, using top topography, that's the uh, quadrants of the body, uh, the abdominal cavity, understanding where things are located in the chest based on the ribs. And you'll be able to kind of identify where the different body parts are. So when we have damage uh, that goes inside the body, you can understand where the pain's coming from and what could be the uh, potential outcomes. So let's talk about the major body systems. First, we've got the musculoskeletal system. It's actually two different systems, muscles and skeleton. They work together to give the body shape, protect your vital organs, and provide movement. So give shape, it uh, holds a structure. Your head would just kind of be a glob sitting up on top of your shoulders if you didn't have a skull. Uh, protect vital organs, the skull protects the brain. Uh, the chest wall protects the uh, heart and the, the liver and the lungs. The pelvis protects major blood vessels and your reproductive organs. And then it provides movement. You couldn't move without your legs and arms. So we've got the uh, all three things are used, uh, are key functions. The skeletons consist of the skull and spine, the ribs, sternum, shoulders, upper extremities, pelvis, lower extremities, all coming together to form the structure to keep us moving upright and protected. So you don't have to memorize all the parts of every bone, but you should be familiar with all the different bones and where they're located. Uh, there's some great songs out there by Hannah Montana on how to uh, memorize the different bone parts. Highly recommend those. So the skull, it's a bony structure that uh, protects the head, and it's also dangerous because it's a bony structure that protects the head. It is an enclosed container, so if the brain starts to swell, then we create more pressure inside and causes problems, but it's also there to protect it in case we have any type of external trauma. So the cranium, the top, back, and sides, and the face is the front. That should be fairly easy to remember. You've got all the bones in the face. You've got the mandible, maximal, nasal bones, orbits, and zygomatic arches. These are important to identify and check for different types of injuries because they form our airway for the patient. If you don't have a mandible or maxilla, you don't have good protection of the airway. The nasal bones causes breathing difficulties too. Orbits, very dangerous for uh, eye injuries. So lots of danger if we get any fractures to the uh, fra uh, facial bones and it's very important that we understand where they are and what they're supposed to be doing. Here's kind of the visual representation. This is one I would just uh, try to cover up all the names and replace them with your own words. It would be real easy for me just to uh, take this picture and cover up the, the words and then ha hand it to you as a quiz. So something to think about there. The spinal column, it comes in 33 vertebrae and the spinal cord goes down the center. That gives the spinal cord the protection. The spinal, the vertebrae also give us the ability to move, bend, bend sideways, twist, and gives us that protection we need for all the nerves coming in and out. So it's important to understand the 33 vertebrae and where they are located. As we get further into the 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 study, we'll uh, identify which vertebrae are located where. The thorax has 12 ribs and a sternum. The top ribs, the number one, gets right up underneath the clavicle. And the 10th and 11th ribs 
are kind of free floating in the low back. They kind of protect the bottom of the uh, uh, liver and other major blood vessels in there. So here's the uh, spinal column. You've got seven cervical vertebrae, atlas one and axis two, or C1 and C2, sit right up underneath the base of the skull. So they're fairly well protected. The uh, C3, 4, and 5 are the ones that can get damaged the easiest, um, and they're the most dangerous because they control how your diaphragm works. So they control whether you can breathe or not. So people that have fractured have four. A good way to remember how many parts are in which, or how many vertebrae are in each part of your spine, you've got seven in the cervical. You eat breakfast at seven. You eat lunch at twelve, so you've got twelve in your thoracic, and you eat your dinner at five, so you have five in the lumbar, and then five and four. So seven, twelve, five, five and four. It's one way to start memorizing it. The pelvis is a a grouping of several bones that kind of come together and form a ring down at the base of the spine with the uh, sacrum and coccyx kind of at the back. Then you got the ilium, ischium, the, and then the pubis around to the front. Hip joints is where the head of the femur comes in and connects with the pelvis. That's another location that we have injuries sometimes. Lower extremities. The femur is the upper leg bone, really big bone, hard to break, but if it does break, we have some serious issues. Uh, we have some bleeding that we need to worry about and other issues. Patella is the kneecap, tibia is the front bone in the leg, fibula is the back, the ankle consists of the malleolus, the medial mal or lateral malleolus, the medial mal malleolus, those are the bottom of the tibia, and then the tarsals, which are the bones of the ankles. The foot, you've got metatarsals, the calc calc uh, calcaneus, the heel, and the phalanges for the toes. You, like again, you, if you've had anatomy and physiology, you don't have to memorize each part of the bone, like you had to for those classes, but understanding where the calcaneus and the phalanges are compared to the metatarsals helps you understand where things are when we're talking about different injuries. Upper extremities, you've got the clavicle and scapula that form the shoulder girdle. Uh, that's the AC joint. Then we've got the humerus, is the upper bar bone of the arm. And then you've got the radius and the ulna. The radius is on the thumb side, the ulna is on the other side. Wrist, you've got your carpals. Just remember, carpal tunnel is in the wrists. Then you got your metacarpals and the phalanges for your finger bones. There's a better drawing. Uh, it's better in your book. It's hard to see on the screen here, but it shows all the different bones. Again, easy, easy test options for me. Joints. That's where we connect bones. Uh, and like other things, we call joints in Colorado. Um, they're formed when two bones come together. We have two ba main types of joints. We've got the ball and socket and the hinge. You do have some other joints uh, in the... In the body, but these are the two main we're concerned about for injuries. Uh, ball and socket, you'd have something that uh, has more rotation than just up and down. So that'd be like your hip, your uh, your shoulder joints. The hinge joint would be like your fingers, your knees. Muscles, divided up into three main categories here. Voluntary are your skeletal muscles, the ones that you can use to move around. By being, saying they're voluntary, it means they need some type of electrical stimulation to move, whether it's a direct thought process that sends a signal out through your nerves or a spontaneous response like you touch, put your hand on a hot stove and you pull it back before you think about it. Involuntary would be like your uh, esophagus, your uh, stomach, your intestines, the main of digestive system. The, the way we um, process food, you don't have to think, I, I need to digest my food, it just happens. Cardiac muscle, strictly in the heart, its main function or main uh, way it 
differentiates differentiates itself from other parts of the body and the muscles is it has what's called automaticity. It creates its own electrical impulses to make the heart that muscle contract. So as we get further into cardiac, we'll learn about the pacemaker and how it sends those signals out, but automaticity is a term you need to be aware of. The next system we want to talk about is our respiratory system. It functions to bring air in so we can draw the oxygen off that air and use it for our body to process and create energy. And then we ex exhale to get rid of the carbon dioxide and other waste products that are created during the metabolism within our body. So inhalation brings oxygen in, exhalation gets rid of carbon dioxide. The respiratory anatomy, you got the nose and mouth. That's key to getting the air into the body. That's our preferred route to get air in and out. If there's another route created, that causes problems for us. So we need to be looking for those options. We also call that the oral pharynx and nasal pharynx. Their uh, oral means mouth, nasal means nose. So those are the pharynxes. Once the air goes through the trachea down into the lungs, as it goes down, it goes past the glottis. Uh, the glottis is an opening that goes into the trachea. We have what's called the epiglottis. Epi means above, so epiglottis sits on top of the, the glottic opening, which gives us some protection so when we swallow food, it doesn't go down into our trachea. The larynx is where our voice cords are. There's a cartilage uh, membrane that goes right around the larynx. That's the top of the uh, uh, trachea. Trachea is, the, there's one cervical ring in the trachea. It's called the cricoid. That's a complete round circle. Um, all the rest of them have a space at the back. They're more C-shaped and have a little muscle on the back so that they can expand and contract as needed. But you've got that cricoid membrane or cricoid cartilage, which is one full circle. That's when you uh, work with a paramedic, they will ask you sometimes to do cricoid pressure. That means they want you to grab that little cricoid ring in the neck and push it backwards so that it pushes the vocal cords for, uh, further, further uh, posterior so that they can get the intertracheal tube between the vocal cords. It's a little trick they, they like to use and you'll come into handy when you can actually find it for them. Once you get the past the trachea, it gets those into the bronchi and the alveoli. The bronchi are the tubes that go down into the lungs and it branches down to the very end where you get alveoli. The alveoli are the little sacs that we have air transfer back and forth. They're very, uh, uh, they have very high blood flow, which allows for the capillary transfer of the different uh, gases back and forth. What causes the air to go in and out is pressure changes. So we have the diaphragm at the very bottom of the lungs. It kind of uh, sits up underneath the lungs. It's a muscle. And as it changes, expands and contracts, it changes the pressure inside the chest cavity and the body will naturally try to equalize the pressure. So if we decrease the pressure, it's going to suck air in until the pressure is equalized. If we increase the pressure, it's going to push air out until the pressure is equalized with the outside. Here's a visual representation of the major parts of the respiratory system. We've got the upper airway, the pharynx and uh, oral pharynx, no, uh, nasal pharynx, down to the larynx. The dividing line between the upper airway and the lower airway is the epiglottis. Once it goes into the trachea, past the epiglottis, now we uh, get into the bronchial tubes and down into the lung tissue itself. Inhalation is an active process. It's, it's not one of those that we have to think about, but the body sends a, a simulation to the muscles and says, you need to contract. So the diaphragm contracts, the intercostal muscles contract, Everything moves outward, making that negative pressure inside the lungs. Typically, most time, more times than not, exhalation is a passive process. So as the muscles relax, the chest wall decreases in size and increases the pressure on the, the 
air that's in the lungs, and then it will try to push the air out to equalize the pressure again. You can forcefully, ex forcefully exhale. That's how we blow out our birthday candles, but it's not necessary to have forceful uh, exhalation. It's usually just a passive process. Ventilation is a mechanical movement of air from the outside to the alveoli. Respiration is when we have the gas exchange between the cells and the bloodstream. So we have blood cells coming into the, the lungs, into the capillaries that surround the alveoli, and we have gas exchange. Carbon monoxide and oxygen transfer between the two the cells through the membranes in the alveoli. So that's respiration. When the cell, the red blood cell, gets over to the uh, end cell somewhere else in the body and it transfers the oxygen in, picks up the waste carbon dioxide, that's respiration. So ventilation was, is mechanical. Respiration is the actual exchange of the gas. Oxygenated blood goes away, uh, it's carried from the lungs to the heart, then pumped to the rest of the body. So you pick up the oxygen in the alveoli, the bloodstream pushes that back, or the heart pulls that back in, and then pumps it out to the rest of the body. At the cellular level, we have that gas exchange happening, and the deoxygenated blood comes back to the lungs so that uh, we can get rid of it. Here's a couple of uh, little differences we're going to see as we talk about the anatomy and physiology of a child versus an adult. The nose is smaller. So you see in here, the nose and mouth is smaller, but if you look at the, the mouth, the tongue, it's the same size. So that's a problem for us. Get the smaller area, but the same size tongue, so it's more prone to get blockage. The other thing we need to know about is the head is huge on the kid. So you see that you have a nice curve of the trachea here. If you've got an adult laying supine, the trachea is flat. So to fix this, we need to raise the shoulders up a little bit, and then everything will be perfectly aligned again. So thinking about that when the kid's having difficulty breathing, maybe it's as simple as lifting the shoulders up a little. As the child matures, these cartridge, cartilage rings improve in quality, and so they become more rigid and more able to protect the airway too. So those are the things we're talking about when we're concerned about the kids' airways. So cardiovascular system, we have three major components. The pump, the pipes, the fluids. So the heart's the pump, the blood vessels are the pipes, and you have the fluid is the blood. So we're going to talk about each one of these individually here. So the heart is four chambers. It's two upper chambers called the atria and two ventricles which are the lower chambers. We have left and right. So we've got right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The atriums are little waiting rooms. They draw the blood in to the heart, wait until they're actually filled up and then the ventricles suck in all that blood at once so they can pump it out much faster. If there's not an atrium or the patient has what you, you see on TV advertisements, sometimes the atrial fibrillation, the atrium aren't pumping and sucking the blood into the heart the way they're supposed to, so the ventricles have a harder time pushing the blood out. So they have to work together. It's a fine, uh, fine dance they do. Atrium brings the blood in holds it a second, pushes it into the ventricles, ventricles push it out. So it's, it's important that we understand how the blood flows through the heart so when we have problems, we can kind of tell where the problems are coming from. Here's kind of a better look at how the heart looks when you uh, kind of break it down. So we've got the vena cava, superior, inferior, bringing the blood into the heart, it comes in through the right atrium, comes into this chamber, then when the heart beats, it pushes it into the right ventricle. You've got the valve here, the tricuspid valve. Blood comes in. Once that valve closes, 
the ventricle squeezes the blood back out and it goes to the lungs. It go, goes to the pulmonary arteries. Blood vessels that leave the heart are called arteries. Blood vessels that come back to the heart are called veins. This is the one blood vessel that's called an artery that has deoxygenated blood because it's come in through the vena cava into the right side of the heart and now it's being pushed to the lungs to go pick up some oxygen. So it goes to the lungs, then comes back to the lungs in the pulmonary veins. And this is the opposite. It's coming to the heart, so it's a vein, but it's coming from the lungs, so it has oxygen. This dumps into the left atrium, holds it for half a second, and then drops it into the right or the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve or mitral valve. Once it's filled, valve closes as it, and it pushes it out through the aorta and uh, inferior and superior. So it comes back down the back side of the heart and dumps into the abdominal cavity and down through the body. So understanding how the blood flows through the heart, it's very important understanding how our disease processes work. The other thing we talked about the automaticity, the heart sends out a signal from what's called the sinoatrial node. That's the pacemaker of the heart. That's a test question somewhere along the line is what is the pacemaker of the heart? SA node or sinoatrial node. It sends out a signal through the atrium and says contract. So it squeezes the muscle here. As it's filling up the ventricles, the AV junction holds a signal for a portion of a second long enough to fill this up and close the door and then it releases it and sends it down the bundle of his up the Purkinje fibers and makes the ventricles contract. So you've got an SA node contracting these two, the AV node holding it while it fills up and then as soon as it fills it releases it and it makes the ventricles contract. So major blood vessels, coronary arteries. These are the arteries that come right off the aorta that feed blood into the car, uh, cardiac muscle. The aorta is the blood vessel that comes off the back of the heart out of the right, left, left ventricle and feeds the body. Pulmonary artery goes to the lungs. Carotid artery goes up the side of the neck. There's an interior and exterior carotid artery. So, and then right and left. So you've got four carotid arteries going up through the neck. Must think the brain's kind of important because we have four arteries to make sure we keep it fed. Femoral artery runs down the inner thigh and provides blood to the lower extremities. Brachial artery goes down the upper extremities and runs down the inside of the humerus. Radial artery is where we take a pulse. Dorsalis tibial or posterior tibial is behind the ankle bone, the malleolus. Interior, exterior malleolus, ankle bone, both sides, you can feel the pulse. And dorsalis pedis is the pulse on top of the foot. This is one, if you find it, I would mark it with a pen so you can find it next time. Here's a representation of the gas exchange that happens. Blood comes in through the arteries, goes down to the capillary bed. That's where you have the gas exchange, the real thin walls. They can exchange the oxygen and the carbon dioxide back and forth and it goes back into the venous system. Because the artery system has pressure behind it, because it's, it's got the pumping of the heart, the venous system does not have it. So you've got valves to keep backflow from happening. So that's what, something you'll learn when you get into uh, IV classes when you're putting IVs in you run into these valves sometimes but they're necessary in there they keep the blood from flowing backwards by mistake. Four major components of the blood we're going to talk about here. You've got your plasma that's the liquid part of the blood that keeps everything looped up and moving around. Red blood cells are the 
transports of the uh, bloodstream. They pick up oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide, they, they push uh, glucose around. The white blood cells are your security guards. They're like the mall cops. They walk around looking for things that don't belong. Sometimes they can get confused with regular s tissue, just like a mall cop sometimes uh, makes mistakes. So um, this is also how the uh, fi uh, vaccines work. They show the wanted poster, poster to the white blood cells, and they start making plans. And if they see that that bad guy running around the uh, body, they'll attack it. The platelets are your road crews. They patch up any holes that happen. Sometimes they get confused and patch up the wrong places, or their patch breaks loose and it goes to a smaller artery and uh, causes problems for us. A pulse is what happens when the heart beats and pushes that wave of blood through the arteries. A pulse is how you can feel it go through that artery. If you put a little pressure on an artery anywhere you've got a bone behind it, you will feel it pushing against your finger that you're putting the pressure on it with. So that is the pulse wave going through the body. Uh, you can find it anywhere there's close to the bone. We've got it in the wrist, the upper arm, the neck, the femoral artery behind the knee, the popliteal. You've got it in the posterior tibial, the dorsalis pedis. We can find it in the forehead. Uh, pretty much anywhere we have a blood vessel that's big enough we can get a good finger on it. Pulses uh, that we've got, we've got the peripheral pulses which are radial, brachial, posterior tibial, and dorsalis pedis. These are the ones that tell us that the heart is pumping adequately. If we get the blood all the way to the fingertips, we know we've got a good uh, circulatory system. The central pulses would be the carotid femoral. These are more uh, interior. They're closer to the heart. They're bigger blood vessels. So we expect to find those even if we don't find the peripheral ones. If you don't find a carotid pulse or a femoral pulse, then we've got some other issues. Now, like I said, the central pulses are the ones you feel if you're not getting good perfusion. Uh, that just tells you your patient's sick. Blood pressure. We can feel the pulse, but we don't know how much pressure's behind it until we can actually listen to it go past our blood pressure cuff. The As we re listen to the blood pressure, we're going to hear a the pressure as it goes through the blood vessel with some resistance on it and then we're going to have the pressure that's just residual in the blood vessel so we've got the systolic which is when it squeezes and diastolic is the resting between ventricle contractions so perfusion is measured at the cellular level if we've got good perfusion the cells are functioning normal we have poor perfusion or hypoperfusion, it means they're not getting enough oxygen, they're not getting enough blood flow, and it could be a problem. What causes the poor perfusion can be anything that's wrong with the pump, the pipes, the fluids. So the heart issue, the blood vessels, or the, fu the fluid itself. Life support chain, we have to have everything working together in unison. So if the respiratory system's not bringing oxygen in and taking carbon dioxide away, then we're not going to have perfusion. If the cardiovascular system is not moving the blood around so we can transport that oxygen and the carbon dioxide back and forth, then we're going to have problems. So that's why we have the cardiopulmonary system kind of lumped together most of the time. The lymphatic system kind of maintains our blood, uh, our fluid balance. It helps us supply fluid into the bloodstream, uh, getting the plasma built up where we need it it brings fluid into the tissues so that, that's your lymphatic system you have uh, hormones that are transported through the lymphatic system these are located these are produced in the uh, adenoids the tonsils the spleen the thymus the nodes they all part of the lymphatic system typically we don't have a lot of EMS related issues with the lymph system 
Uh, it's just more one of those things that if you find a problem, it means they need to get to the hospital. When somebody has a mastectomy, they take out the lymph nodes on that side. Uh, if they've had a bilateral, it's as simple as asking the patient, hey, what size do they take blood pressures on? There might be some differences for you. But what we want to do is avoid taking it on the side they've had the lymph nodes removed just because it can cause more damage for them. Simple solution for every patient, whether you, they've, you, you don't even know if they have a mastectomy or any other issues with their lymphatic system, ask them if it's okay to take a blood pressure on the arm you've chosen. Typically, we pick the one that's closest to us, so we don't have to move back and forth, but ask the patient. They're the one that's in charge here. Can I take a blood pressure on this arm? Oh, okay, I'll use the other arm. Thank you. Here's another representation of the nervous system. So, key components of the nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. That's your central nervous system. Then you have all the peripheral nerves that come off that are sensory nerves or motor nerves. They provide every uh, contact with the rest of the body into the central nervous system. Central nervous systems, the brain and the spinal cord, that's our thinking process, the major control points. Peripheral, our sensory and motor nerves. We have the autonomic nerves, nervous system, which is our involuntary functions. If I scare you, I don't have to tell you to get your heart rate up and start getting anxious. Your body automatically does that. It's a fight or flight process. I don't have to tell you to relax to go to bed. Once you go to sleep, your body shuts down things and goes into a, a really slower pace to give your body time to rest. So that's your autonomic nervous system doing the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. The digestive system, you've got the stomach, the small intestine, large intestine, it breaks down food into smaller components and then dumps those into the bloodstream for you so they can take it out to the body to be used by the cells for energy and then brings the waste product back by, drops it into the small intestine, large intestine. Other things that help out with the digestive system, the liver stores extra glucose for us. It also filters the blood. Uh, trying to make sure it's safe for us to use. The gallbladder gives us bile, which helps us digest the fatty foods, breaks those down a little bit better. The pancreas gives us insulin, major component to help get the sugar into the cells. The spleen holds on to our extra blood cells. So if we need a replacement blood cell, it's right there. And then we've got the appendix, which no one really knows what it does except get infected occasionally and it's where the uh, large intestine and the small intestine meet in the lower right quadrant. The integumentary system is your skin. It gives us protection. It keeps the bad stuff out. It keeps the good stuff in. It also provides a water balance. You sweat out when you need to get rid of extra water. It maintains your body temperature. If you get cold, your skin tightens up and tries to keep you warmer. If you get hot, it opens up pores and starts sweating, which causes evaporation, which cools off the body. It also does some uh, shock absorption. So if you do get hit, it doesn't cause damage to the interior of the body as much. Three layers of your skin. The epidermis is that outside. That's the dead skin cells. They kind of fall off all the time. The dermis is the tissue underneath that provides that uh, uh, the nerve endings, the hair follicles, there's capillaries throughout there, and then you've got the subcutaneous. This is where the major blood vessels kind of flow and it has the fatty cells which gives you that cushioning. Here's the representation of what that looked like. So you've got the epidermis at the top. The dermis is where all the things happen and then down the subcutaneous you've got the blood vessels taken everything back and forth and you've got the nerves and it sits right on top of the muscles. Endocrine system is the hormones that regulate the body. So we've got uh, the pancreas, 
dropping out uh, insulin for us, the adrenal glands, epinephrine. Epinephrine helps us get excited when we have a uh, fight or flight response. It also helps us if we're having trouble maintaining a uh, blood pressure or a uh, uh, pulse rate. It increases those for us. Here's portions of the endocrine system. Uh, the Got the pituitary gland up in the brain. You got the thyroid gland, the thymus. Then we've got the adrenal glands around the kidneys. You've got the ovaries, testes, and pancreas. All diff different hormone secretion systems. Typically not issues for us in EMS, but we need to be aware of them. The renal system. This helps maintain our fluid balance in our body. Helps maintain the right pH. If the more you know about pH, the it's uh, the body likes to be in a fairly neutral posture, so it raises or lowers the pH based on the needs. The kidneys are the organs that fun uh, that filter out the blood. Uh, they filter the fluids as they come out. If you've ever seen somebody who's been on kidney dialysis, they uh, have to go in every two or three days to get their blood filtered because their kidneys aren't doing the filtering for them. So it, uh, it's kind of like the uh, fuel filter of the body. The bladder holds the urine that is drawn out waiting to go uh, to excrete from the body. So they work together on a process. It's kind of a picture of the renal system for you. You get the kidneys located about uh, the, mid, the midline of the uh, abdominal cavity. Kidneys are technically retroperitoneal. They're outside of the abdominal cavity, but they sit on the back. Interesting thing is when they do surgery on the, on the kidneys, they typically go in from the front. Um, if they have to implant a, trans a transplanted kidney, they'll put them in the front of the body too. So they don't have to uh, go in through the back and disrupt the uh, spinal, uh, spinal column or the uh, ribs. It's interesting. Um, your readers, that's what moves the blood, uh, urine from the bladder to the kidneys or from the, from the kidneys to the bladder. And then urethra gets it out of the bladder into the exterior part, uh, the external environment. So these typically don't have a lot of damage to them unless we have a uh, direct, uh, impact like, a, a penetrating wound or some, uh, some pelvic trauma. Reproductive system, the male genitalia is pretty well exposed to trauma, so that's something we have to uh, be aware of. The testicles and the penis are uh, easily damaged from some type of external trauma. Um, be very uh, supportive of your patient because there are very painful injuries there. It's just a lot of visual representation of where the different uh, reproductive organs are. Female reproductive organs are a little bit more protected in the pelvis. You got your ovaries, your uterus, and your vagina. Everything's interior, so to have damage, you have to have some type of penetrating trauma. So as usual, if you have any questions, write them down and bring them to class so we can talk about them. Thanks.